Deep in the heart of the Allegheny Mountains and the western panhandle of Maryland endures two icons from the past century and their stage. Once known as Maryland's best kept secret, the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad has spent almost three decades giving credence to an area known as the cradle of the Industrial Revolution, offering the only opportunity to experience steam-powered travel in the state for over 25 years. That experience made the Western Maryland one of the most visited tourist railroads in the nation and put the historic city of Cumberland, Maryland back on the map. Since its beginnings, the railroad has been revered, well regarded as a time machine, transporting countless individuals back in time to an era not so long ago. An era of romance and travel. An era when hard work could move thousands of tons of goods across a rugged and unforgiving landscape. Retelling the stories and legends, steam reigned supreme in the Allegheny Mountains, and railroading was a natural part of this region's landscape. 734 and 1309, Beauty and the Beast, they exist as a source of pride and accomplishment, breaking the barrier between old and new, both relied upon and known for remarkable performances. Once operating the most powerful locomotive of her type in the world, and now operating the world's largest of her type. Come with us now as we dive into the history and travels of this extraordinary railroad and its importance to the community it serves. Since its establishment, the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad has called the city of Cumberland, Maryland home, a home with a history dating back over three centuries. Cumberland, known as the Queen City, is located about 150 miles from the Atlantic seaport of Baltimore and was once a strategic location, sitting at the confluence of Wills Creek and the Potomac River. This once optimally located city was established in 1787 and for a time rivaled Baltimore regarding its prominence and size. Cumberland today serves as Western Maryland's largest city, as well as the county seat of Allegheny County. Cumberland was named in honor of the son of King George II, Prince William, the Duke of Cumberland. The city is built on and around the site of Fort Cumberland, which served as a staging point for British General Edward Braddock and his unsuccessful attack on Fort Duquesne during the French and Indian War, which led to his death. Fort Cumberland also served as an outpost for American Colonel George Washington and is the site of his first military headquarters serving in the Colonial Army. 
1794, Washington returned, then President of the United States, to Fort Cumberland for examination of troops assembled to put an end to the Whiskey Rebellion. Cumberland had the unique blessing of the surrounding hillsides holding a wealth of timber and minerals that would supply the Industrial Revolution. And that fact was noted in the mid to late 1700s by settlers moving through the area. However, before the wealth could be tapped, a means of transportation to and from the Chesapeake Bay and Atlantic Ocean were needed. And several years after Cumberland's establishment, the West was being opened to settlers, beginning in 1811 with the construction of a road which came to be known as the Cumberland Road. Known as the first gateway to the West, today U.S. Route 40, known as the National Road, extends west toward the Ohio River and beyond, and was deemed the holy grail of roads in the United States at the time. Discussions having been started in 1804, the National Road exists as the nation's first fully federally funded and constructed road and was turned over to the control of the states in 1836. Not to be confused with the Cumberland Gap in Tennessee, lies the Narrows, where the railroads expanded west through a natural cut formed by Wills Creek over a period of 137 million years in which it carved Wills Mountain in two, leaving a path just wide enough to accommodate from north to south the B&O and C&P on the north bank of Wills Creek, the creek itself, a realignment in 1836 of what became U.S. Route 40, and the GC&C and PRR on the south bank. The National Road may have been Cumberland's first historic travel achievement, but soon after, in November 1842, the railroad arrived in the form of the Baltimore and Ohio, which had beat its rival, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, to Cumberland. Despite having surveyed west of the Ohio River, the C&O Canal terminated in Cumberland in 1850, and preserved remains serve as a testament to some of the most ambitious industrial experiments in American history. The canal cost $11 million and took 22 years to complete due to funding delays, illnesses, and legal ramifications. Several miles northwest of Cumberland, in the small village of Mount Savage, Maryland in 1844, one of the most significant transportation events in the Western Hemisphere unfolded in the mills of the New York and Iron Coal Company. That significant event was the development of the first rolled iron rails in America being produced domestically, which freed the country from relying on Europe for railroad products. With many transportation options then available, Cumberland grew in short order to become a major economic force and manufacturing center. Operating alongside smaller industries such as glass blowing, brewing and textile manufacturing, and tin plating, by the early 1900s, Cumberland had become an icon of the American dream, with a vast amount of local business and industries that helped the population grow by some 20,000 since its humble beginnings as a trading post during the French and Indian War. In addition to the B&O, Cumberland once played host to the Cumberland and Pennsylvania Railroad, the Cumberland and Westerport Electric Railway, the Georges Creek and Cumberland, the mighty Pennsylvania Railroad, and the West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh Railroad. By 1906, Cumberland welcomed its final railroad into town in the form of the Western Maryland Railroad, which was chartered in 1852 as the Baltimore, Carroll, and Frederick Railroad. Expansions of the Western Maryland through the years allowed the line to reach Cumberland by means of the Cumberland Extension, as well as the purchase of the West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh Railroad, the WVC and P having been built and merged from several smaller lines radiating from Elkins, West Virginia, reaching Cumberland in the late 1880s. The Cumberland Extension had been financed by George Gould and the Fuller Syndicate, and was built to the highest specifications to rest away service from the rival Baltimore and Ohio. Deck plate girder bridges, long blasted rock tunnels, enhanced by slightness of grade, were the hallmarks of the Cumberland Extension, 
ending up being roughly 60 miles in length, 5.8% of which was either atop bridges or through tunnels. The Western Maryland had also purchased the Georges Creek and Cumberland Railroad for its right-of-way through the Cumberland Narrows, which was done in the prelude for its eventual expansion west to connect with the Wabash-Pittsburgh Terminal Railroad, another railroad under control of George Gould and the Fuller Syndicate. The purchase of WVC&P provided a large tract of land to construct a servicing facility, as well as the ability to tap into some of the most valuable coal reserves in the nation, while providing access into downtown Cumberland by means of Union Station, which was located at the corner of Baltimore and Canal Streets. Union Station was served by the Georges Creek and Cumberland, Pennsylvania Railroad, and the WVC&P. Disaster struck with the financial panic of 1907. The Western Maryland was hit hard and teetered on bankruptcy, which finally occurred in 1909 when the WM fell into receivership after George Gould and the Fuller Syndicate collapsed due to overexpansion. In 1910, the railroad re-emerged from receivership as the Western Maryland Railway. Expansion was needed to make the new enterprise a viable route to transport freight and passengers further west, so land was acquired from the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal to construct a new station. In addition, a route through the Alleghenies to Connellsville, Pennsylvania, to connect with the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad was surveyed. Western Maryland's Connellsville Extension was constructed and built roughly to the same specifications as the Cumberland Extension. Later known as the lowest maximum elevation rail crossing through the heart of the Alleghenies, the route was 21 miles from Cumberland to the summit, located at the Eastern Continental Divide at what became Deal, Pennsylvania. The route averaged a 1.75% grade, which when compared to the B&O's main line at 31 miles long and grades topping 2%, allowed the Western Maryland to employ an easier climb to the Allegheny Plateau. Several impressive viaducts on the new line were constructed. Keystone Viaduct at 910 feet long, crossing Flaherty Creek and the B&O. And the 1,908 foot Salisbury Viaduct crosses the fertile Castleman River Valley, as well as the B&O, as it snakes its way westward to Pittsburgh and beyond. Four tunnels were also built. Brush Tunnel is located five miles west of Cumberland and is 914 feet in length. Borden Tunnel, next up the line, located two miles west of Frostburg, is 957 feet long. West of Borden and located one mile east of the summit at Deal, the 3,295-foot Big Savage Tunnel was built of blasted rock and timber bracing construction. Flanked by a pair of bridges, the remaining tunnel, Pinkerton, is located at a sharp bend in the Castleman River and lies within clear sight of the B&O's Pittsburgh Main Line. 
The new Cumberland Station opened in July 1913, and shortly thereafter, the Connellsville Extension was opened, which over the years became an important piece along the Western Maryland system. In 1927, the B&O was ordered by a federal court to divest themselves of a large portion of Western Maryland stock purchased from the estate of John D. Rockefeller. The stock, which totaled 27% of the entire Western Maryland, was placed in a trust with the Chase Bank of New York, and this marked the beginning of the end for the very independent Western Maryland. There were still the golden years ahead for the WM, such as the purchases of additional motive power. Modern rolling stock, as well as right-of-way improvements, continued well into the 1970s, as the WM was part of the famed Alphabet Route. The Alphabet Route was a consortium of several major railroads designed to expedite freight shipments and included the New York, Chicago, and St. Louis, Wheeling and Lake Erie, Pittsburgh and West Virginia, Western Maryland, Reading Company, Central Railroad of New Jersey, Lehigh and Hudson River, and the New York, New Haven, and Hartford. The Western Maryland's dismemberment began in 1964. An abandonment with the majority of the main line occurred in May of 1975, being operated by and eventually absorbed along with the B&O into the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway, which collectively made up Chessie System. Enter the story of the Cumberland and Pennsylvania Railroad, a well-known coal-hauling short line that had its routes dating back to 1844, and eventually was purchased by the Consolidated Coal Company of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mount Savage, Maryland was the base of operations for the CNP, and for a brief time became a center for steam locomotive development. James A. Milholland, Jr. served as the master mechanic and vice president of the CNP before being lured away to become president of the George's Creek and Cumberland in 1879, and is credited before his departure from the CNP for the construction of the Mount Savage Shop Complex in the 1860s, of which many of the original structures still exist to this day. Milholland's father, James Milholland Sr., was like his son, a master mechanic who gained experience on the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad. Both Milholland men are known for their respective inventions of many railroad products. The Milhollands um, were very practical engineers and they were able to optimize a lot of the iron manufacturing technology and they were continually uh, researching different approaches. What can we put in with the iron mix to make it stronger? Uh, how can we cast things properly? Because there were a lot of trouble in the early days with the wheels cracking, such like that. So they really developed and uh, maximized that technology of iron and near steel manufacturing right there in Mount Savage. Beginning in 1883, a locomotive catalog was issued for the Mount Savage Locomotive Works by Thomas B. Innes Company of New York and listed five types of engines for sale and their specifications. The CNP was once one of the most profitable short-line railroads in the nation, hauling coal from the mines to interchange with other railroads or the CNO Canal. Coal from Allegheny County, and in particular the George's Creek Valley, was some of the most sought-after coal in the nation and was mined from locations possessing some colorful names such as Pompeii Smash, Ocean, Midlothian, Borden, Nicap, Carlos, and Lord. Despite being profitable, Consolidated Coal Company sold its C&P holdings to the Western Maryland in 1944, as the United States was gradually shifting towards oil as the number one choice for heating, as well as rail and waterway transportation. The C&P was fully absorbed into the Wild Mary by 1953. Portions of the CNP continued to be operated by the WM and by its successor, the Chessie system, until most of the lines were abandoned.
Starting in the spring of 1989, a collaborative effort which began nearly two years earlier between the Western Maryland chapter NRHS, members of the local government, and rail preservationist Jack Showalter came to fruition with the creation of the Allegheny Central Railroad. The Allegheny Central was set to operate from Cumberland, Maryland, over 14 miles of former Western Maryland Railway track with an additional two miles being operated over former Cumberland and Pennsylvania Railroad right-of-way to Frostburg, Maryland. The western terminus of Frostburg was built in 1891 by architect E. Francis Baldwin. Amazingly, the depot still survived. The depot was restored for almost 1.5 million in 1988, which then included a restaurant, bakery, and a bar. Costing roughly $875,000 from the state and county and cities of Cumberland and Frostburg, the appropriated funding provided for the rehabilitation and construction of portions of the 16 miles of track. And these funds also helped with the installation of a turntable adjacent to the Frostburg Depot. The turntable was donated by CSX and was previously used by the Western Maryland Railway at their Elkins Yard facility. Most of the tracks on the WM from a location two miles to the east of Frostburg, known as switch number nine, to the coal shafts at Borden, last operated in the early 1980s, had to be removed from the main line and placed on the long abandoned CNP right of way. Once the rebuilding of this short section of the CNP was completed, and the Allegheny Central Railroad was provided the contract for operation, passenger service resumed on the line. Rail enthusiast Jack Showalter was contracted to provide excursion service with equipment that he owned, having previously operated in Virginia. When Allegheny Central came in, uh, Showalter wasn't the friendliest of guys. Uh, he came in to make some bucks, and he did, and then he took his locomotives and went away. But, uh, yeah, myself and almost all the members of the chapter up there uh, were very much involved, volunteer work, doing whatever we could to get a railroad in town. And that was successful, and it's been proved to be successful now. And now we're, you know, the place to go now they got the big engine. But... Um, yeah, there, there was quite a bit of work being done on the side uh, to get that whole operation going on. The star attractions of the railroad, numbers 1238 and 1286, formerly Canadian Pacific Railway's G5 D-Class 462 Pacific type steam locomotives. For two years, numbers 1238 and 1286 powered most of the excursion trains until late 1991, when the contract for operation was terminated. Now handcuffed with a railroad and no operator, the management sought to resume services for the 1992 season. And by that spring, the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad Development Corporation had the operation rebranded as the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad. In the initial years of operation, the WMSR leased quite a diverse collection of American Locomotive Company and Montreal Locomotive Works diesels from an industry supplier, Sheridan Rail Operations. The 
locomotives included two Alcos, RS3 number 199, an RSD5 number 1689, and a trio of MLW FPA 4s wearing numbers 305, 306, and 800. By that summer, a locomotive at the Illinois Railroad Museum had been identified as a candidate, and preparations began in earnest to bring the engine to its new home in Cumberland, Maryland. July 4, 1992, at the interchange between WMSR and CSX, the locomotive arrived having been towed at 25 miles an hour or less all the way from Illinois to Cumberland, after which she was towed to the WMSR shop in Ridgely, West Virginia, to complete her transformation into WMSR 734. When a steam locomotive is returned to service, countless hours are spent on the planning and execution of numerous details. After 734's initial inspection was performed, it was easy to see that she was tired and worn out, to say the very least. With the restoration, the crew and volunteers at the WMSR decided to jump headfirst into the rebuild effort and not much concern was given to the amount of funding necessary for her return to service which cost half a million dollars when finished in July 1993. The engine was renumbered to 734, which integrated her original LS and I number and the addition of a preceding digit representative of the 700 series employed by the Western Maryland Railway's numbering system during the steam era. During this time, modifications to the locomotive were carried out with a dual purpose, and steps were taken to preserve the locomotive for future generations as well as increased power and efficiency when and where possible. These modifications included a replacement of the locomotive's cab, as well as a replacement tender constructed in 1918 by Commonwealth Steel and served former New York Central System 482 Mohawk number 2663. Until the tender was purchased by the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad, it had been storing sand and oil for Conrail locomotives in Cleveland, Ohio. And after almost a year in the shop, with countless hours spent on the restoration, 734 was ready for her return to service. Now adorned in the handsomely designed Western Maryland Fireball Scheme of 1941, 734 gleamed and was an impressive sight to behold. And after a few days spent testing performance of the numerous appliances, the locomotive was moved out under its own power to the scales at the CSX Cumberland Terminal to be weighed. Post-restoration, final calculations put 734 at an impressive 517,000 pounds, or 257.5 tons, a full 100,000 pounds heavier than prior to her restoration, which made her the world's largest operating locomotive of her type. By August 1993, 734 returned to revenue service, once again a reliable performer.
you. So that's their, their personal time. I believe that was like third place last year. So the record they're trying to be first. Ready for After many years of faithful service, the impending demise of this proud machine began in 2012, when the WMSR began a search for an additional steam locomotive to help supplement 734 and her diesel counterparts, EMD Jeep 30s number 501 and 502. Over the preceding 25 years, 734 had certainly proven her reliability and gained an astonishing amount of public enthusiasm. However, time was catching up as the engine was steadily approaching the federally mandated 1,472-day inspection due to take place in April 2016. These 15-year rebuilds, or after 1,472 days of use, meant that 734 would be out of service for quite a while as the locomotive was expected to require a massive amount of work. After an intensive search and numerous candidates considered, a decision emerged from one of the most unlikely sources. Located in Baltimore, Maryland, at the B&O Railroad Museum, sat former Chesapeake and Ohio Railway 2662 number 1309, which was built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in November 1949 and operated for C&O until 1956. Years of neglect in seawater in the air the 1309 seemed on the outside to be a foolish undertaking. Early inspections of the 1309 had been falsely interpreted that the locomotive was in rather decent shape. However, looks were deceiving as the engine would require a lengthy and massive undertaking to bring it back to life. In 2014, the locomotive was purchased, prepped, and shipped to the WMSR to begin her restoration.
In 2015, the Western Maryland reached out to the public to help send off 734 in grand style. And the season proved to be a busy year for the railroad with 734 having performed almost flawlessly up to within days of her 100th birthday. In April 2016, 734 performed for the public, operating a photo freight in which she suffered a major failure and had to be taken to the shop for repairs, which, when completed, returned her to service for her final appearance, in which she operated the weekend of April 9th and 10th. Seven thirty four has only been seen once by the public since her retirement during Cumberland's annual Heritage Day celebration in June twenty seventeen. Meanwhile, the 1309 restoration, which by late 2016 was under the direction of Gary Bensman and his diversified rail contractors, proceeded at a snail pace, due in large part to funding and material issues. Twenty twenty was an overall bad year for tourist railroads and museums across the country. 
forcing most operations to either severely limit capacities or cancel the operating season entirely, which the WMSR elected to do following its Valentine's Day trains. The 2021 season for the railroad was marked with a Memorial Day return to operation and the soon after appointment of a new superintendent. And this proved to be a huge success as the railroad boosted ridership to its highest level in almost four years and placed equipment back in service, having generally recovered from the health crisis. Late in November 2021, the railroad marked the return of 1309 with several break-in runs to test the engine before being placed into revenue service. These tests were necessary to ensure the safety, comfort, and enjoyment of those patronizing the Western Maryland's adaptation of the Polar Express that was soon to follow as the debut of 1309 in excursion service. Restoration of this massive and complex machine was completed at a cost of $3.5 million and has since delighted thousands around the world. Thank <laughs> you. 
in January 2024, the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad announced the long-term lease of the Georges Creek Railway from its owners, 1830 Group LLC, and has developed plans to operate the railroad as their Georges Creek division. The Georges Creek Railway was formed in 2005 to acquire and operate the Georges Creek subdivision as CSX was abandoning the line, which was suffering from a serious decline in its primary revenue source, coal. Coal and iron were the lifeblood of the Georges Creek Valley and was the reason this line was built in the 1850s and later consolidated by the Cumberland and Pennsylvania Railroad to become their main line between Cumberland and Piedmont, West Virginia. The historic towns of Lonaconing, Barton, Midland, and Westernport are well documented in the annals of U.S. history thanks to the multitude of industries, aside from coal and iron, that called this area home. The iron industry eventually dried up and left King Coal dominant in this area, and after the absorption of the Cumberland and Pennsylvania in 1953 by the Western Maryland, the northern end of the line from Frostburg to Console No. 10 loadout was abandoned. The remainder of the line operated as the Georgia Creek Subdivision by the Western Maryland, Chessie System, and into the CSX days when 8.54 miles from Morrison's to Carlos was transferred to WMS LLC in December of 2005 for the operation of the Georgia Creek Railway. However, WMS went bankrupt and the 1830 Group was formed. Together with the Georges Creek Railway, they filed to acquire and operate the line as a Class 3 common carrier in 2006 from Morrison's to Console No. 10 loadout. The Verso paper mill, located in nearby Luke, Maryland, was serviced by both CSX and the Georges Creek Railway, which was the latter's only customer. The GCK operated inside of the mill, handling interchange traffic from CSX to various locations within the facility. The mill began life in the early 1900s being operated by the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Company before becoming West Vaco, Mead West Vaco, and finally Verso. In 2015, the 1830 Group and Georges Creek Railway acquired the remaining 5.4 miles of the Georges Creek subdivision from Morrison's to Westernport, as well as over half a mile of the former Western Maryland Railway Thomas subdivision with plans for freight traffic that never materialized. Over the years, the GCK purchased a collection of authentic Western Maryland Railway motive power, such as EMD GP9s number 25 and 39, SD40 number as well as SD35 number 7436. Alco power was represented in the carcass of FA2 number 303 and various engine models from other railroads. Some locomotives owned by Georges Creek never touched home rails, and when the Verso mill closed in 2019, the Georges Creek Railway ceased operation shortly thereafter. Since its establishment, the Georges Creek Railway had undertaken several right-of-way improvements in its pursuit to reopen the line and re-establish freight shipments. However, several washouts and heavy vegetation north of the town of Moscow have yet to be repaired, keeping the line inoperable. In 2021, the Georgia Creek Railway filed for abandonment as the railroad had existed in a state of dormancy since the closure of the mill and has been the topic of rails to trails conversion. The goal of the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad is to operate the line as a separate entity from its already established tourist operation as the Georgia Creek Division, and plans call for the operation of freight and passenger trains on the line which will contribute to the revitalization of the local communities that this historic rail line operates through.
continuing traditions and making new ones while rejuvenating the community in which it serves. If the return of 1309 and the success of its railroad is a view into the future, it is certainly a bright one. All aboard for the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad.